a joy I've got. I get to talk about psychological capital and share some insights with you about what that's all about. But I might start with a, a little story. Um, and the story is about, I guess, a little bit of my journey. And believe it or not, and I'm going to carbon date myself now, um, I've been in the consulting business for about 18 years and I buggered about in organisations for about 15 years before that. And all the time I was curious about a question. I was curious about what is it that unlocks and activates performance? And then you're ch chasing behind that, what is it that kind of triggers people to flourish and find their potential? So more than 30 years on the journey. <laughs> I was feeling pretty tired. Then I tripped into Melbourne Uni and I tripped into some positive psychology and everything just started to come together. And psychological capital was one of the things that jumped out at me because it was one of those things that occurred to me was missing. And I'd done a lot of work with organisations around how can we unlock performance, what can we do, but what are the tools we can actually use to do that? How can we really help people uncover their potential? And the bit I was particularly curious about is what the hell is managing got to do with all of this? What's the role of the leader and the manager in this equation of unlocking performance? We're all busy trying to be our best, but we're not on our own. There are people around us. And one of the things I love about psychological capital is it starts to attend to what we can do as leaders and managers of others as well to really start to unlock their potential. So what I figure we'll do tonight is um, effectively three discrete things. And this is probably not a bad way of framing it up. Um, what I'd like to do is share a little bit of information with you about psychological capital. What is it? A little bit of the background, a little bit of the science, and some of that you're likely to know, some of it you may not know. But in doing that, what we'll achieve is a sort of shared platform of understanding. And then from there, I want to jump into three quick examples with you of how I've kind of activated this and woven it into the work that I've done in leadership development. And then I want to share with you finally, by way of wrapping up, um, some insights from the field. So having done that work around leadership development, what's the learning and, and what sort of wisdom can I share with you that might resonate um, with the work that you're doing? Does that sound like an okay journey? That's good for a Wednesday, isn't it? <laughs> All right, so let's think about it. Psychological capital. Fred Luthens. Fred Luthens has been around forever. I mean forever. I can carbon date him and he's older than me. Um, <laughs> He's been a manage management uh, professor in the US at um, mainly at one college, um, so uni uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, for over 40 years. His background is organisational psych and organisational behaviour. And he's the guy that's credited with having written the book, the very first book about organisational behaviour. Have you heard of Fred? Yeah. yeah, a lot of people have sometimes. If you haven't heard of him, you've probably read something that he wrote. So Fred has spent a lot of time through his career looking at um, org behaviour and what goes on in organisations and how people perform and how you activate performance and how you unlock capacity in organisations. And then he more recently became interested in positive psychology and said, well, what about the nexus? What about where these two things join together? Something interesting might occur. And that's how he moved into starting to frame up his concept, and he's generally credited with having developed the concept of psychological capital, um, but that's how we kind of discovered it. It was around saying, what can we do in organisations that really unlocks performance and potential? So that's where he came from um, in terms of his thinking and the genesis of it. He's prolific. He writes and he writes and he writes. And um, if you want to inquire more and you're curious about psychological capital, then either of um, the two books that Fred's co-authored um, around psych psychological capital, a great place to start, as is Googling him, and you will find a ton of articles, information, YouTube clips. Um, he's been a really great promoter of psychological capital, what it's all about and how people can use it. So what Fred's also really good at is packaging concepts and ideas. Really good at it. And one of the things we often struggle with with organisations and thinking about positive psychology and how we can bring it to life in organisations is this question of how will I sell it? What will I say that doesn't have everyone running for the hills thinking it's very kumbaya and we're not doing that here? And what Fred has been great at is packaging positive psychology into an organisational language and an organisational narrative. And I've found from personal experience that makes it very easy to kind of land it, sell it, 
get people engaged enough to experiment and then get a result. And here's how he does it. When we think about um, capital in organisation, um, Fred talks about, and I agree with him, that there's four kinds of distinct capital that we can think about. Um, and see if you notice this just creep up on you in a way that sounds pretty safe. So the first is financial capital, money, resources, the tools we've got. We've known about that for years. And then there's human capital, the people. Their skills, knowledge, attributes, all of the talent that they bring into the equation. And then more recently we've added to the mix social capital. This idea that it's not just what we know but who we know. That's somehow going to add value and add advantage to performance and business outcomes and results. So psychological capital sits neatly as the fourth piece in that pie. And psychological capital is particularly attending to who are we and who are we becoming. So that makes sense, doesn't it? It sits there very neatly. Now, if you're an organisation and you're interested in making the most out of your capital, sweating your assets, why wouldn't you be doing this? Doesn't feel scary. Nobody needs to hug anyone yet. It's all going to be OK. So organisations are often quite receptive to it in a way that they might not be receptive to an emerging um, theory that's based in psychology. But this seems safe, so you can get some traction. So, what is psychological capital and how did he get hold of it? Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the four discrete components that make up psychological capital because it's a second order construct. And what that means is it's just a higher sort of overarching construct that is a combination of four other elements that are sitting underneath it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but because it's come out of organisational behaviour and then specifically positive organisational behaviour, it is preoccupied with behaviour, the actions and the way in which people interact and react and work together. So there's a strong focus on interactivity. And what's interesting is psychological capital is by and large seen as state-like. That is, it's a state that people can be in that can be developed. Now, at the very end of the state-like continuum, I guess, is emotions, fleeting emotions. Psychological capital is further along the continuum than that, in about a midpoint, but not as far along a continuum as a trait that we typically think people are going to be born with. So what that means is it's sitting in a sweet spot where it can be developed. And again, that's a nice leverage point, because why would we invest time and effort on something we don't know confidently we can develop? So the positioning of it as a state that can be developed and is reasonably stable over time is a key to why we would engage and get involved in developing psychological capital. In framing up what the four elements that would sit under the title of, of psychological capital would be, um, there was a criteria. And the criteria consisted of four key drivers. And they were that anything that was included in the definition of psychological capital had to be based in the theory, had to be grounded in theory and research. It couldn't be something that we just sort of plucked out of the ether. So it's got a strong scientific anchor. So again, something else that gives it a bit of grunt. You know, it's based in the science, there's evidence in the lab, and then there's pretty high quality research that sits around it and backs it up as a concept. The second criteria was that it needs to be measurable. There's no point in talking about a behaviour and trying to develop a behaviour we can't measure. So a key criteria was measurability. And then our mate Fred, who's so good at packaging, he invented a measure for that. So go Fred. Um, so what you can do is you can pre and post measure. You can pre-measure someone's level of psychap, psychological capital. You can have an intervention and then you can post measure. And you can evidence that there's been movement on the needle mightn't be huge movement, but incremental movement has a multiplier effect in organisational performance. So those little elements of movement get us some terrific traction and results. So measurement was his second criteria. Third criteria, it has to be developable. What is the point of putting elements into a concept called psychological capital if you can't develop each of those elements? So the four elements that currently sit in psychological capital, and Luthens is saying, well, there could be more, but we haven't found them yet, there could be more, but the four that sit there are open to development, and the research sitting around each one of those four elements says it can be developed. And the final one, and this is the kicker that organisations love, and certainly my clients respond really positively to, is it's linked to performance. The evidence seems compelling. If we develop psychological capital, and we can develop it, and we can measure that that's occurred, there is a link to performance. We can see over time incremental lifts in performance. 
both measurable and also in terms of people's response and feedback, where they'll say, I feel more capable, I feel more able, I solve more problems. So we get some really nice feedback loops around performance. So organisations love it. Has that been your own experience? People have used it? It resonates and we still haven't had to hug anyone. <laughs> so what is it? Let's just have a quick dig underneath and see what's underneath psychological capital. Um, four key constructs sitting underneath the title, if you like, or the, the higher order name, psychological capital. The first one is hope. So in building psychological capital, it wasn't about saying, let's get some new concepts and, and stitch them together. It was about saying, let's look at some concepts that are around that have been well tested and are well regarded and see what happens in the dynamic of pulling them together. So that's what we're doing. So the first is hope. And the work that's drawn on in here is Schneider's work around hope theory. So agency, pathways and goals. Someone feels that they've got agency, they're able to influence someone, they can see some pathways or something, they can see some pathways, some ways they're going to do that, and they're goal-oriented. So they'll set some goals around that. That's that subset of hope. That's what we mean. So hope theory and what that looks like in practice. And we can teach that. We can teach pathways and goal setting. And people will set goals and find ways to do things that they believe they can influence. That's their agency. Make sense? So we can teach it. The second thing is self-efficacy. Um, Albert Bandura's work in the 80s around that sense of, I believe I can do this. I believe I've got the capacity to do it. Self-efficacy. And again, people that bring themselves to a task with a sense of, I've got this. I can do this. I can work with you and we can do it together but that sense of I'm active, I can do it, I'm capable, self-efficacy. The third thing that's in the mix for psychological capital, resilience. This idea um, of Marsden's work around developmental psychology, around bouncing back and bouncing forward. So through tough experiences or even adverse circumstances when we feel under threat, stepping up, standing up and meeting those challenges and working through them that sense of resilience. And again, we can teach that once people understand what it is and think about when they've done that themselves. We remind them that they've already got that resiliency, which immediately feeds into their sense of self-efficacy. So the whole thing feeds itself. Final element is optimism. And that's pulling up Marty Seligman's work on learned optimism, where we're saying, you know, the people that have an optimistic outlook present themselves to tasks and life in a more optimistic way. And that has a positive spin into then the results they achieve and the work that they do. Nice. Four really powerful underlying elements, each with a high quality deck of um, science behind them that enable us to say, this is a sound kind of theory. This is not just something they've plucked out of the ether. So that's kind of where we're at with psychological capital. And then our friend Fred, he said, you know what, that's handy. That creates a hero acronym. And let's face it, in organisations, we need to get people to remember things. So having an acronym, having something memorable, matters because it enables people to stay with it and take it away from wherever they learnt it and maybe do something with it. It enables a really quick framework for reflecting on what just happened. How did I make that work? What was I drawing on? So it becomes also a little analysis diagnostic for people. So the hero concept is important. So, how does it show up in organisations? Shows up in one really powerful way, and there's some sub things that kind of lead into this. It shows up in this way. The research suggests that if you've got people who are high in psychological capital, and that spread through your organisation, you're likely to have higher levels of engagement. Which makes sense, because you've got some things going on underneath. You've got this going on, you've got higher levels of job satisfaction. You've got what we call higher levels and greater likelihood of pro-social behaviour. Now, the way that shows up in organisations is people being prepared to work together and collaborate, share, help, support, do good stuff for each other and with each other. So we see that. And then, of course, we see the kicker in performance. So there is a lift in performance of individuals and then some sort of collaborative effect across groups. And increasingly what's happening with the research on psychological capital is it's moving into this area of inquiry about what about shared psychological capital? What about when a whole group, a team, is high in psych app? What happens then? Is there a sort of second sort of loop of dynamic that occurs that enables that group to perform at an even higher level? And the early work on that is suggesting there's probably some, some connection in there and it's probably got some legs. 
Are you starting to think about how easy this is to sell in organisations? It's hitting all the right spots, isn't it? Performance, money, return, and all of this allows organisations to do the things that they're keen to do, to produce results, to create returns, and to keep great people. So it's, it's a, a really positive and self-fulfilling kind of loop. But it begs the question of, um, what do we do? How do we develop psychological capital? And there are a variety of ways you can do it. Um, in the work that's been done in the labs, Lucens has said, you know what, you can actually run some short training programs and develop it. And so one of the training programs that he's designed and mainly used in research and I've designed is two 90-minute sessions. So a three-hour investment and you can get some traction. Now he's worked on that extensively with Boeing and um, Boeing have done some return on investment calculations and they reckon that they got a 270% return on investment. That's a compelling number. The maths is dodgy, but I'd go with it. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? 270%, you're going to need someone to bring that down. Um, the, the math is ambitious, but that's a simple return on you know, effort and performance based, uh, contrasted to the cost of actually doing the development, which is pretty tiny. So there are opportunities to develop psychological capital. Um, it offers a lot for organisations. It also offers some protective things like building people's resilience to stress, building people's resilience to pressure in the workplace, building people's capacity to navigate change. These are all hot issues for organisations. So again, it resonates with organisations. So, business language. All the words wrapped around psychological capital resonate and sit easily in organisations. It's not like you're talking another language. You're already on the same page as most of the people in the organisation and that allows it to slip into people's consciousness easily and almost be welcomed in. They don't have to struggle with the language. Um, it can be developed and measured, so again, organisations are interested in that. It resonates for them. It also resonates with the context. If you've got a lot of change, if you've got people under pressure, if you're wanting more out of people, then building psychological capital seems to be a lever that's going to help that happen. And it's got a positive relationship with performance. So again, it hits, the, it hits the hot spot. So from the field, I want to share with you three quick examples of how I've used this and applied it um, in my work. The first was um, high vis logistics business, transport and logistics. And I thought, we can't go in there and talk about psychological capital. We're going to turn everybody off. They turn up in high vis with their arms folded. They only open their arms to have the morning tea. So what we did was we talked about managing performance and we talked about providing feedback. And everybody who came to those workshops, and it was a one-day workshop, they thought, oh, I'm going to learn how to get rid of people. That's good. I've got some duds. It'll be good to get rid of them. What happened was we said, nah, -uh. let's actually talk about what you can do as a leader to really unlock performance. And we talked about that very gently. We talked about their own experiences of that. And where we really started to bring psychological capital up to the surface was when we talked about feedback. We talked about models for providing feedback and why the model was the way it was. And why would you bother to say to someone, what do you think you can do about that? When as the boss, you know what they need to do and you just want to tell them. Why would you bother to ask that question? And we said, because that will build their psychological capital and that will build performance in your team and that will make your life easier and that will make people want to work with you. And all of a sudden, the arms got unfolded and people started to say, oh, this looks all right. And I had a guy in high vis who'd come off night shift and I said, what do you reckon? And he stopped the room and he said, that's grouse. <laughs> he said, good. And then he said to me, how long has this shit been around? And I said, a long time. So amazingly, high vis, high, high contact, no real history of having decent quality conversations with people. And they used it. Um, what we also did, that was a global rollout with that organisation and what we needed to do was train some trainers and develop some people um, in the skills of, of um, being able to run the workshop. And the people came to the train, the trainers thinking, I'll be out of here in half an hour. And they were there for two days. And again, what we built was a context where what we're doing in this workshop is building psychological capital. And we gave the insights to psychological capital and then said that is why this workshop is built in the way that it is. So we had people thinking, I don't want to run this training. Shift to, I can't wait to do this. This is really powerful. And seeing that movement in the people they worked with. If 
Finally, um, we've used psychological capital really effectively in coaching training and using the GROW model. Are you familiar with the GROW model? Yeah. So when you talk about the GROW model, it maps to PSYCAP, psychological capital, really neatly. Um, why would you ask that person to generate options? Because that's hope theory, that's pathways. Why would you ask that person, so what are you going to do? Because that's that goal setting and building their self-efficacy. Why would you have multiple solutions available? Because when it gets tough, they'll think of something else to do. So there's a really nice mapping, and you know, there's a lot more detail we could go into, but there's a really nice mapping between psychological capital and the way that we train managers and leaders to coach people. So there's some experience from the field. Here's some wisdom from the field by way of wrapping up. Um, here's what we've learned. You've got to be crystal clear about why you're doing it. Why am I introducing psychological capital into this particular program? Why am I talking about it with this group of people? And I reckon on a good day, you've got to link back to strategy. In the high-vis example that I shared, the issue they had was around employee engagement and their engagement data was saying, you people are bad at managing performance and we need to get better at it. So there was a clear and compelling reason to have that conversation. You've got to tailor the approach to suit. With the high-vis people, we never used the word psychological capital. We just hinted at it, but we didn't talk about it and train it explicitly. Um, you've got to share and celebrate success. And we did that so that people couldn't wait to get on this one-day program in the, in the um, logistics environment. And these were people that had actively resisted training for years. But we started to share the good stories about how it was um, a way in which you could deal with, with people that were difficult to deal with. And everyone said, oh, I could get me a piece of that. I want to jump on board and I've heard the food's good. And so they started lining up to come to the thing. Um, one of the things that we didn't do, and I really wish we had, was we didn't really think about measurement. We've got a soft and subtle measurement in the logistics high-vis one in so much as we've got um, engagement data before we did anything and engagement data post. But it's a bit of a long bow to draw the two together. Um, what you can get is the psychological capital instrument to measure. And that's a much tighter, neater measurement of the psychological capital. What was it before we did anything? What is it after? And how is it evolving? So really think about whether you need to measure it to evidence what's going on. Um, you've also got to consider readiness for learning. And if you think the organisation might be a bit resistant, look for the people that are keen to go and ready to go. Scaffold for development. If you set people out with nothing, they'll uh, probably fail. And what we did was we supported people and we would get them back and say, so what's happening? How are your conversations shifting? And if someone had had a success, we shared that. And it was well shared in their network. Um, but they were scaffolded and supported for, de for development. When it didn't go well, we said, OK, so resilience will be the thing you need to draw on right now. Um, and finally, keep at it. Development and potential are iterative. They don't happen in, in a blink. It takes time and it takes effort. So what do you do now? Um, I guess where I'd like to leave you is, have a think about whether or not any of this has resonated. Is this something that your organisation could be interested in? If they are, and if you are, what I suggest is do a bit of reading, snoop around. You Google Fred Luthens and you'll be entertained for hours. <laughs> There's plenty there. Snoop around. Think about why you're doing it and what you get out of it. And if you think that there's something that's got some traction, happy to talk. Hopefully I've prompted some thinking for you. <laughs>